The Whisperer in Darkness by H.P. Lovecraft Seven Refusing to let these cloudy qualms overmaster me, I recalled Noise's instructions and pushed open the six-paneled, brass-latched white door on my left. The room beyond was darkened, as I had known before, and as I entered it I noticed that the queer odor was stronger there. There likewise appeared to be some faint, half-imaginary rhythm or vibration in the air. For a moment the closed blinds allowed me to see very little, but then a kind of apologetic hacking or whispering sound drew my attention to a great easy chair in the farther, darker corner of the room. Within its shadowy depths I saw the white blur of a man's face and hands, and in a moment I had crossed to greet the figure who had tried to speak. Dim though the light was, I perceived that this was indeed my host. I had studied the Kodak picture repeatedly, and there could be no mistake about this firm, weather-beaten face with the cropped, grizzled beard. But as I looked again, my recognition was mixed with sadness and anxiety, for certainly this face was that of a very sick man. I felt that there must be something more than asthma behind that strained, rigid, immobile expression and unwinking, glassy stare, and realized how terribly the strain of his frightful experiences must have told on him. Was it not enough to break any human being, even a younger man than this intrepid delver into the forbidden? The strange and sudden relief I feared had come too late to save him from something like a general breakdown. There was a touch of the pitiful in the limp, lifeless way his lean hands rested in his lap. He had on a loose dressing gown, and was swathed around the head and high around the neck with a vivid yellow scar for hood. And then I saw that he was trying to talk in the same hacking whisper with which he had greeted me. It was a hard whisper to catch at first, since the grey moustache concealed all movements of the lips, and something in its timbre disturbed me greatly. But by concentrating my attention I could soon make out its purport surprisingly well. The accent was by no means a rustic one, and the language was even more polished than correspondence had led me to expect. Mr. Wilmarth, I presume... You must pardon my not rising. I'm quite ill, as Mr. Noyes must have told you, but I could not resist having you come just the same. You know what I wrote in my last letter. There is so much to tell you tomorrow when I shall feel better. I can't say how glad I am to see you in person after all our many letters. You have the file with you, of course, and the Kodak prints and record. <laughs> Noyes put your valise in the hall. I suppose you saw it. For tonight I fear you'll have to wait on yourself to a great extent. Your room is upstairs, the one over this, and you'll see the bathroom door open at the head of the staircase. There's a meal spread for you in the dining room right through this door at your right, which you can take whenever you feel like it. I'll be a better host tomorrow, but just now weakness leaves me helpless. Make yourself at home. You might take out the letters and pictures and record and put them on the table here before you go upstairs with your bag. It is here that we shall discuss them. You can see my phonograph on that corner stand. No, thanks. There's nothing you can do for me. I know these spells of old. Just come back for a little quiet visiting before night. And then go to bed when you please. I'll rest right here. Perhaps sleep here all night, as I often do. In the morning, I'll be far better able to go into the things we must go into. You realize, of course, the utterly stupendous nature of the matter before us. To us, as to only a few men on this earth, there will be opened up gulfs of time and space and knowledge beyond anything within the conception of human science and philosophy. Do you know that Einstein is wrong, and that certain objects and forces can move with a velocity greater than that of light? With proper aid, I expect to go backward and forward in time, and actually see and feel the earth of remote past and future epochs. Can't imagine the degree to which those beings have carried science. There is nothing they can't do with the mind and body of living organisms. I expect to visit other planets, and even other stars and galaxies. First trip will be to Yogoth, the nearest world fully peopled by the beings. It is a strange, dark orb at the very rim of our solar system, unknown to earthly astronomers as yet. 
But I must have written you about this. At the proper time, you know, the beings there will direct thought currents toward us and cause it to be discovered. Or perhaps let one of their human allies give the scientists a hint. There are mighty cities on Yuggoth, great tiers of terrace towers built of black stone like the specimen I tried to send you. That came from Yuggoth. The sun shines there no brighter than a star, but the beings need no light. They have other, subtler senses, and put no windows in their great houses and temples. Light even hurts and hampers and confuses them, for it does not exist at all in the black cosmos outside time and space where they came from originally. To visit Yogoth would drive any weak man mad. But I am going there. The black rivers of pitch that flow under those mysterious cyclopean bridges, things built by some elder race, extinct and forgotten before the beings came to Yuggoth from the ultimate voids, ought to be enough to make any man a Dante or Poe if he can keep sane long enough to tell what he has seen. But remember, that dark world of fungoid gardens and windowless cities isn't really terrible. It is only to us that it would seem so. Probably this world seemed just as terrible to the beings when they first explored it in the primal age. You know, they were here long before the fabulous epoch of Cthulhu was over, and remember all about Sunken Relay when it was above the waters. They've been inside the earth, too. There are openings which human beings know nothing of, some of them in these very Vermont hills. And great worlds of unknown life down there, blue litten Kinyan, red litten Yoth and black, lightless Nakai. It's from Nakai that frightful Sathogua came. You know, the amorphous, toad-like god-creature mentioned in the Nakotic manuscripts in the Necronomicon and the Camorium myth cycle preserved by the Atlantean high priest Clark Ashton. But we will talk of all this later on. It must be four or five o'clock by this time. Better bring the stuff from your bag, take a bite, and then come back for a comfortable chat. Very slowly I turned and began to obey my host, fetching my valise, extracting and depositing the desired articles, and finally ascending to the room designated as mine. With the memory of that roadside claw print fresh in my mind, Akeley's whispered paragraphs had affected me queerly, and the hints of familiarity with this unknown world of fungus life— forbidden Yuggoth made my flesh creep more than I cared to own. I was tremendously sorry about Akeley's illness, but had to confess that his hoarse whisper had a hateful as well as pitiful quality. If only he wouldn't gloat so about Yuggoth and its black secrets. My room proved a very pleasant and well-furnished one, devoid alike of the musty odor and disturbing sense of vibration, and after leaving my valise there I descended again to greet Akeley and take the lunch he had set out for me. The dining room was just beyond the study, and I saw that a kitchen L extended still farther in the same direction. On the dining table, an ample array of sandwiches, cake, and cheese awaited me, and a thermos bottle beside a cup and saucer testified that hot coffee had not been forgotten. After a well-relished meal, I poured myself a liberal cup of coffee, but found that the culinary standard had suffered a lapse in this one detail. My first spoonful revealed a faintly unpleasant acrid taste so that I did not take more. Throughout the lunch I thought of Akeley sitting silently in the great chair in the darkened next room. Once I went in to beg him to share the repast, but he whispered that he could eat nothing as yet. Later on, just before he slept, he would take some malted milk, all he ought to have that day. After lunch I insisted on clearing the dishes away and washing them in the kitchen sink, incidentally emptying the coffee which I had not been able to appreciate. Then, returning to the darkened study, I drew up a chair near my host's corner and prepared for such conversation as he might feel inclined to conduct. The letters, pictures, and record were still on the large center table, but for the nonce we did not have to draw upon them. Before long I forgot even the bizarre odor and curious suggestions of vibration. I have said that there were things in some of Akeley's letters, especially the second and most voluminous one, which I would not dare to quote or even form into words on paper. This hesitancy applies with still greater force to the things I heard whispered that evening in the darkened room among the lonely haunted hills. Of the extent of the cosmic horrors unfolded by that raucous voice I cannot even hint. He had known hideous things before, 
but what he had learned since making his pact with the outside things was almost too much for sanity to bear. Even now, I absolutely refuse to believe what he implied about the constitution of ultimate infinity, the juxtaposition of dimensions and the frightful position of our known cosmos of space and time in the unending chain of linked cosmos atoms which makes up the immediate supercosmos of curves, angles, and material and semi-material electronic organization. Never was a sane man more dangerously close to the arcana of basic entity. Never was an organic brain nearer to utter annihilation in the chaos that transcends form and force and symmetry. I learned whence Cthulhu first came, and why half the great temporary stars of history had flared forth. I guessed, from hints which made even my informant pause timidly, the secret behind the Magellanic clouds and globular nebulae, and the black truth veiled by the immemorial allegory of Tao. The nature of the doles was plainly revealed, and I was told the essence, though not the source, of the hounds of Tindalos. The legend of Yig, father of serpents, remained figurative no longer, and I started with loathing when told of the monstrous nuclear chaos beyond angled space, which the Necronomicon had mercifully cloaked under the name of Azathoth. It was shocking to have the foulest nightmares of secret myth cleared up in concrete terms, whose stark, morbid hatefulness exceeded the boldest hints of ancient and medieval mystics. Ineluctably, I was led to believe that the first whisperers of these accursed tales must have had discourse with Akeley's outer ones, and perhaps have visited outer cosmic realms as Akeley now proposed visiting them. I was told of the Black Stone and what it implied, and was glad that it had not reached me. My guesses about those hieroglyphics had been all too correct, and yet Akeley now seemed reconciled to the whole fiendish system he had stumbled upon, reconciled and eager to probe farther into the monstrous abyss. I wondered what beings he had talked with since his last letter to me, and whether many of them had been as human as that first emissary he had mentioned. The tension in my head grew insufferable, and I built up all sorts of wild theories about the queer, persistent odor and those insidious hints of vibration in the darkened room. Night was falling now, and as I recalled what Akeley had written me about those earlier nights, I shuddered to think there would be no moon. Nor did I like the way the farmhouse nestled in the lee of that colossal forested slope leading up to Dark Mountain's unvisited crest. With Akeley's permission, I lighted a small oil lamp, turned it low, and set it on a distant bookcase beside the ghostly bust of Milton. But afterward I was sorry I had done so, for it made my host's strained, immobile face and listless hands look damnably abnormal and corpse-like. He seemed half incapable of motion, though I saw him nod stiffly once in a while. After what he had told, I could scarcely imagine what profounder secrets he was saving for the morrow. But at last it developed that his trip to Yugoth and beyond, and my own possible participation in it, was to be the next day's topic. He must have been amused by the start of horror I gave at hearing a cosmic voyage on my part proposed. For his head wabbled violently when I showed my fear. Subsequently he spoke very gently of how human beings might accomplish, and several times had accomplished, the seemingly impossible flight across the interstellar void. It seemed that complete human bodies did not indeed make the trip, but that the prodigious surgical, biological, chemical, and mechanical skill of the outer ones had found a way to convey human brains without their concomitant physical structure. There was a harmless way to extract a brain, and a way to keep the organic residue alive during its absence. The bare, compact, cerebral matter was then immersed in an occasionally replenished fluid within an ether-tight cylinder of a metal mined in Yugoth, certain electrodes reaching through and connecting at will with elaborate instruments capable of duplicating the three vital faculties of sight, hearing, and speech. For the winged fungus beings to carry the brain cylinders intact through space was an easy matter. Then, on every planet covered by their civilization, they would find plenty of adjustable faculty instruments capable of being connected with the encased brains, so that after a little fitting, these traveling intelligences could be given a full sensory and articulate life, albeit a bodiless and mechanical one, at each stage of their journeying through and beyond the space-time continuum. It was as simple as carrying a phonograph record about and playing it wherever a phonograph of the corresponding make exists. Of its success, there could be no question. Akeley was not afraid. Had it not been brilliantly accomplished again and again? For the first time, one of the inert, wasted hands raised itself and pointed stiffly to a high shelf on the farther side of the room. There, in a neat row, 
stood more than a dozen cylinders of a metal I had never seen before, cylinders about a foot high and somewhat less in diameter, with three curious sockets set in an isosceles triangle over the front convex surface of each. One of them was linked at two of the sockets to a pair of singular-looking machines that stood in the background. Of their purport I did not need to be told, and I shivered as with ague. Then I saw the hand point to a much nearer corner where some intricate instruments with attached cords and plugs, several of them much like the two devices on the shelf behind the cylinders, were huddled together. There are four kinds of instruments here, Wilmarth, whispered the voice. Four kinds, three faculties each, makes twelve pieces in all. You see, there are four different sorts of beings presented in those cylinders up there. Three humans, six fungoid beings who can't navigate space corporeally, two beings from Neptune. <laughs> God, if you could see the body this type has on its own planet. And the rest entities from the central caverns of an especially interesting dark star beyond the galaxy. In the principal outpost inside Round Hill, you'll now and then find more cylinders and machines. Cylinders of extra-cosmic brains with different senses from any we know. Allies and explorers from the uttermost outside. And special machines for giving them impressions and expression in the several ways suited at once to them and to the comprehensions of different types of listeners. Round Hill, like most of the beings' main outposts all through the various universes, <laughs> is a very cosmopolitan place. Of course, only the more common types have been lent to me for experiment. Here, yeah. take the three machines I point to and set them on the table. That tall one with the two glass lenses in front. Then the box with the vacuum tubes and sounding board. And now, the one with the metal disc on top. Now, for the cylinder with the label B67 pasted on it. Just stand in that Windsor chair to reach the shelf. Heavy? Never mind. Be sure of the number, B-67. Don't bother that fresh, shiny cylinder joined to the two testing instruments, the one with my name on it. Set B-67 on the table near where you've put the machines, and see that the dial switch on all three machines is jammed over to the extreme left. Now connect the cord of the lens machine with the upper socket on the cylinder. There. Join the tube machine to the lower left-hand socket and the disc apparatus to the outer socket. Now move all the dial switches on the machines over to the extreme right. First the lens one, then the disc one, then the tube one. That's right. I might as well tell you that this is a human being, just like any of us. I'll give you a taste of some of the others tomorrow. To this day, I do not know why I obeyed those whispers so slavishly or whether I thought Akeley was mad or sane. After what had gone before, I ought to have been prepared for anything, but this mechanical mummery seemed so like the typical vagaries of crazed inventors and scientists that it struck a chord of doubt which even the preceding discourse had not excited. What the whisperer implied was beyond all human belief. Yet were not the other things still farther beyond and less preposterous only because of their remoteness from tangible concrete proof? As my mind reeled amidst this chaos... I became conscious of a mixed grating and whirring from all three of the machines lately linked to the cylinder, a grating and whirring which soon subsided into a virtual noiselessness. What was about to happen? Was I to hear a voice? And if so, what proof would I have that it was not some cleverly concocted radio device talked into by a concealed but closely watching speaker? Even now I am unwilling to swear just what I heard, or just what phenomenon really took place before me. But something certainly seemed to take place. To be brief and plain, the machine with the tubes and sound box began to speak, and with a point and intelligence which left no doubt that the speaker was actually present and observing us. The voice was loud, metallic, lifeless, and plainly mechanical in every detail of its production. It was incapable of inflection or expressiveness, but scraped and rattled on with a deadly precision and deliberation. Mr. Wilmarth, it said, I hope I do not startle you. I am a human being like yourself, though my body is now resting safely under proper vitalizing treatment inside Round Hill, about a mile and a half east of here. I myself am here with you. My brain is in that cylinder and I see, hear, and speak through these electronic vibrators. In a week I am going across the void as I have been many times before, and I expect to have the pleasure of Mr. Akeley's company. 
I wish I might have yours as well, for I know you by sight and reputation, and have kept close track of your correspondence with our friend. I am, of course, one of the men who have become allied with the outside beings visiting our planet. I met them first in the Himalayas, and have helped them in various ways. In return, they have given me experiences such as few men have ever had. Do you realize what it means when I say I have been on 37 different celestial bodies, planets, dark stars, and less definable objects, including eight outside our galaxy and two outside the curved cosmos of space and time? All this has not harmed me in the least. My brain has been removed from my body by fission so adroit that it would be crude to call the operation surgery. The visiting beings have methods which make these extractions easy and almost normal, and one's body never ages when the brain is out of it. The brain, I may add, is virtually immortal with its mechanical faculties and a limited nourishment supplied by occasional changes of the preserving fluid. Altogether, I hope most heartily that you will decide to come with Mr. Akeley and me. The visitors are eager to know men of knowledge like yourself and to show them the great abysses that most of us have had to dream about in fanciful ignorance. It may seem strange at first to meet them, but I know you will be above minding that. I think Mr. Noyes will go along to the man who doubtless brought you up here in his car. He has been one of us for years. I suppose you recognized his voice as one of those on the record Mr. Akeley sent you. At my violent start, the speaker paused a moment before concluding. So, Mr. Wilmarth, I will leave the matter to you, merely adding that a man with your love of strangeness and folklore ought never to miss such a chance as this. There is nothing to fear. All transitions are painless, and there is much to enjoy in a wholly mechanized state of sensation. When the electrodes are disconnected, one merely drops off into a sleep of especially vivid and fantastic dreams. And now, if you don't mind, we might adjourn our session till tomorrow. Good night. Just turn all the switches back to the left. Never mind the exact order, though you might let the lens machine be last. Good night, Mr. Akeley. Treat our guest well. Ready now with those switches? That was all. I obeyed mechanically and shut off all three switches, though dazed with doubt of everything that had occurred. My head was still reeling as I heard Akeley's whispering voice telling me that I might leave all the apparatus on the table just as it was. He did not essay any comment on what had happened, and indeed no comment could have conveyed much to my burdened faculties. I heard him telling me that I could take the lamp to use in my room and deduce that he wished to rest alone in the dark. It was surely time he rested, for his discourse of the afternoon and evening had been such as to exhaust even a vigorous man. Still dazed, I bade my host good night and went upstairs with the lamp, although I had an excellent pocket flashlight with me. I was glad to be out of that downstairs study with the queer odor and vague suggestions of vibration, yet could not, of course, escape a hideous sense of dread and peril and cosmic abnormality as I thought of the place I was in and the forces I was meeting. The wild, lonely region, the black, mysteriously forested slope towering so close behind the house, the footprints in the road, the sick, motionless whisperer in the dark, the hellish cylinders and machines, and above all, the invitations to strange surgery and stranger voyagings. These things, all so new and in such sudden succession, rushed in on me with a cumulative force which sapped my will and almost undermined my physical strength. To discover that my guide noise was the human celebrant in that monstrous bygone sabbat ritual on the phonograph record was a particular shock, though I had previously sensed a dim, repellent familiarity in his voice. Another special shock came from my own attitude toward my host whenever I paused to analyze it, for much as I had instinctively liked Akeley as revealed in his correspondence, I now found that he filled me with a distinct repulsion. His illness ought to have excited my pity, but instead it gave me a kind of shudder, it was so rigid and inert and corpse-like, and that incessant whispering was so hateful and unhuman. It occurred to me that this whispering was different from anything else of the kind I had ever heard, that despite the curious motionlessness of the speaker's moustache-screened lips, it had a latent strength and carrying power remarkable for the wheezings of an asthmatic. I had been able to understand the speaker when wholly across the room, and once or twice it had seemed to me that the faint but penetrant sounds represented not so much a weakness as deliberate repression, for what reason I could not guess. From the first I had felt a disturbing quality in their timbre, 
Now, when I tried to weigh the matter, I thought I could trace this impression to a kind of subconscious familiarity, like that which had made Noise's voice so hazily ominous. But when or where I had encountered the thing it hinted at was more than I could tell. One thing was certain. I would not spend another night here. My scientific zeal had vanished amidst fear and loathing, and I felt nothing now but a wish to escape from this net of morbidity and unnatural revelation. I knew enough now. It must indeed be true that cosmic linkages do exist, but such things are surely not meant for normal human beings to meddle with. Blasphemous influences seemed to surround me and press chokingly upon my senses. Sleep, I decided, would be out of the question, so I merely extinguished the lamp and threw myself on the bed, fully dressed. No doubt it was absurd, but I kept ready for some unknown emergency, gripping in my right hand the revolver I had brought along and holding the pocket flashlight in my left. Not a sound came from below, and I could imagine how my host was sitting there with cadaverous stiffness in the dark. Somewhere I heard a clock ticking and was vaguely grateful for the normality of the sound. It reminded me, though, of another thing about the region which disturbed me, the total absence of animal life. There were certainly no farm beasts about, and now I realized that even the accustomed night noises of wild living things were absent, except for the sinister trickle of distant unseen waters— that stillness was anomalous, interplanetary, and I wondered what star-spawned intangible blight could be hanging over the region. I recalled from old legends that dogs and other beasts had always hated the outer ones and thought of what those tracks in the road might mean. 8. Do not ask me how long my unexpected lapse into slumber lasted or how much of what ensued was sheer dream. If I tell you that I awaked at a certain time and heard and saw certain things, you will merely answer that I did not wake then, and that everything was a dream until the moment when I rushed out of the house, stumbled to the shed where I had seen the old Ford, and seized that ancient vehicle for a mad aimless race over the haunted hills which at last landed me after hours of jolting and winding through forest-threatened labyrinths in a village which turned out to be Townsend. You will also, of course, discount everything else in my report and declare that all the pictures, record sounds, cylinder and machine sounds, and kindred evidences were bits of pure deception practiced on me by the missing Henry Akeley. You will even hint that he conspired with other eccentrics to carry out a silly and elaborate hoax, that he had the express shipment removed at Keene, and that he had noise make that terrifying wax record. It is odd, though, that Noyes has not even yet been identified, that he was unknown at any of the villages near Akeley's place, though he must have been frequently in the region. I wish I had stopped to memorize the license number of his car, or perhaps it is better after all that I did not. For I, despite all you can say and despite all I sometimes try to say to myself, know that loathsome outside influences must be lurking there in the half-unknown hills, and that those influences have spies and emissaries in the world of men. To keep as far as possible from such influences and such emissaries is all that I ask of life in future. When my frantic story sent a sheriff's posse out to the farmhouse, Akeley was gone without leaving a trace. His loose dressing gown, yellow scarf, and foot bandages lay on the study floor near his corner easy chair, and it could not be decided whether any of his other apparel had vanished with him. The dogs and livestock were indeed missing, and there were some curious bullet holes both on the house's exterior and on some of the walls within, but beyond this nothing unusual could be detected. No cylinders or machines, none of the evidences I had brought in my valise, no queer odor or vibration sense, no footprints in the road, and none of the problematical things I glimpsed at the very last. I stayed a week in Brattleboro after my escape, making inquiries among people of every kind who had known Akeley, and the results convince me that the matter is no figment of dream or delusion. Akeley's queer purchases of dogs and ammunition and chemicals and the cutting of his telephone wires are matters of record, while all who knew him, including his son in California, concede that his occasional remarks on strange studies had a certain consistency. Solid citizens believe he was mad, and unhesitatingly pronounce all reported evidences mere hoaxes devised with insane cunning, and perhaps abetted by eccentric associates. But the lowlier country folk sustain his statements in every detail. He had showed some of these rustics his photographs in black stone, and had played the hideous record for them, and they all said the footprints and buzzing voice were like those described in ancestral legends. 
They said, too, that suspicious sights and sounds had been noticed increasingly around Akeley's house after he found the black stone, and that the place was now avoided by everybody except the mailman and other casual, tough-minded people. Dark Mountain and Round Hill were both notoriously haunted spots, and I could find no one who had ever closely explored either. Occasional disappearances of natives throughout the district's history were well attested, and these now included the semi-vagabond Walter Brown, whom Akeley's letters had mentioned. I even came upon one farmer who thought he had personally glimpsed one of the queer bodies at flood time in the swollen West River, but his tale was too confused to be really valuable. When I left Brattleboro, I resolved never to go back to Vermont, and I feel quite certain I shall keep my resolution. Those wild hills are surely the outpost of a frightful cosmic race, as I doubt all the less since reading that a new ninth planet has been glimpsed beyond Neptune, just as those influences had said it would be glimpsed. Astronomers, with a hideous appropriateness they little suspect, have named this thing Pluto. I feel beyond question that it is nothing less than knighted Yugoth, and I shiver when I try to figure out the real reason why its monstrous denizens wish it to be known in this way at this special time. I vainly try to assure myself that these demoniac creatures are not gradually leading up to some new policy hurtful to the earth and its normal inhabitants. But I have still to tell of the ending of that terrible night in the farmhouse. As I have said, I did finally drop into a troubled doze, a doze filled with bits of dream which involved monstrous landscape glimpses. Just what awaked me, I cannot yet say, but that I did indeed awake at this given point I feel very certain. My first confused impression was of stealthily creaking floorboards in the hall outside my door, and of a clumsy, muffled fumbling at the latch. This, however, ceased almost at once so that my really clear impressions began with the voices heard from the study below. There seemed to be several speakers, and I judged that they were controversially engaged. By the time I had listened a few seconds, I was broad awake, for the nature of the voices was such as to make all thought of sleep ridiculous. The tones were curiously varied, and no one who had listened to that accursed phonograph record could harbor any doubts about the nature of at least two of them. Hideous though the idea was, I knew that I was under the same roof with nameless things from abysmal space, for those two voices were unmistakably the blasphemous buzzings which the outside beings used in their communication with men. The two were individually different, different in pitch, accent, and tempo, but they were both of the same damnable general kind. A third voice was indubitably that of a mechanical utterance machine connected with one of the detached brains in the cylinders. There was as little doubt about that as about the buzzings, for the loud, metallic, lifeless voice of the previous evening, with its inflectionless, expressionless scraping and rattling, and its impersonal precision and deliberation had been utterly unforgettable. For a time, I did not pause to question whether the intelligence behind the scraping was the identical one which had formerly talked to me, but shortly afterward I reflected that any brain would emit vocal sounds of the same quality if linked to the same mechanical speech producer, the only possible differences being in language, rhythm, speed, and pronunciation. To complete the eldritch colloquy, there were two actually human voices, one the crude speech of an unknown and evidently rustic man, and the other the suave Bostonian tones of my erstwhile guide, Noise. As I tried to catch the words which the stoutly fashioned floor so bafflingly intercepted, I was also conscious of a great deal of stirring and scratching and shuffling in the room below, so that I could not escape the impression that it was full of living beings, many more than the few whose speech I could single out. The exact nature of this stirring is extremely hard to describe, for very few good bases of comparison exist. Objects seem now and then to move across the room like conscious entities, the sound of their footfalls having something about it like a loose, hard-surfaced clattering, as of the contact of ill-coordinated surfaces of horn or hard rubber. It was, to use a more concrete but less accurate comparison, as if people with loose, splintery wooden shoes were shambling and rattling about on the polished board floor. On the nature and appearance of those responsible for the sounds, I did not care to speculate. Before long, I saw that it would be impossible to distinguish any connected discourse. Isolated words, including the names of Akeley and myself, now and then floated up, especially when uttered by the mechanical speech producer, but their true significance was lost for want of continuous context. Today I refuse to form any definite deductions from them, and even their frightful effect on me was one of suggestion rather than of revelation. 
The terrible and abnormal conclave I felt certain was assembled below me, but for what shocking deliberations I could not tell. It was curious how this unquestioned sense of the malign and the blasphemous pervaded me despite Akeley's assurances of the outsider's friendliness. With patient listening, I began to distinguish clearly between voices, even though I could not grasp much of what any of the voices said. I seemed to catch certain typical emotions behind some of the speakers. One of the buzzing voices, for example, held an unmistakable note of authority, whilst the mechanical voice, notwithstanding its artificial loudness and regularity, seemed to be in a position of subordination and pleading. Noises' tones exuded a kind of conciliatory atmosphere. The others I could make no attempt to interpret. I did not hear the familiar whisper of Akeley, but well knew that such a sound could never penetrate the solid flooring of my room. I will try to set down some of the few disjointed words and other sounds I caught, labeling the speakers of the words as best I know how. It was from the speech machine that I first picked up a few recognizable phrases. The speech machine. Brought it on myself. Sent back the letters and the record. End on it. Taken in. Seeing and hearing. Damn you. Impersonal force, after all. Fresh, shiny cylinder. Great God. First buzzing voice. Time we stopped. Small and human. Akeley. Brain. Saying. Second buzzing voice. Aralatotep. Wilmarth. Records and letters. Cheap imposture. Noise. An unpronounceable word or name, possibly Nagakathun, harmless, peace, couple of weeks, theatrical, told you that before. First buzzing voice, no reason, original plan, effects, noise can watch, round hill, fresh cylinder, noises car. Noise. Well, all yours, down here, rest, place. Several voices at once in indistinguishable speech, many footsteps, including the peculiar loose stirring or clattering, a curious sort of flapping sound, the sound of an automobile starting and receding, silence. That is the substance of what my ears brought me as I lay rigid upon that strange upstairs bed in the haunted farmhouse among the demoniac hills. Lay there fully dressed, with a revolver clenched in my right hand and a pocket flashlight gripped in my left. I became, as I have said, broad awake, but a kind of obscure paralysis nevertheless kept me inert till long after the last echoes of the sounds had died away. I heard the wooden, deliberate ticking of the ancient Connecticut clock somewhere far below, and at last made out the irregular snoring of a sleeper. Akeley must have dozed off after the strange session, and I could well believe that he needed to do so. Just what to think or what to do was more than I could decide. After all, what had I heard beyond things which previous information might have led me to expect? Had I not known that the nameless outsiders were now freely admitted to the farmhouse? No doubt Akeley had been surprised by an unexpected visit from them. Yet something in that fragmentary discourse had chilled me immeasurably, raised the most grotesque and horrible doubts, and made me wish fervently that I might wake up and prove everything a dream. I think my subconscious mind must have caught something which my consciousness has not yet recognized. But what of Akeley? Was he not my friend, and would he not have protested if any harm were meant me? The peaceful snoring below seemed to cast ridicule on all my suddenly intensified fears. Was it possible that Akeley had been imposed upon and used as a lure to draw me into the hills with the letters and pictures and phonograph record? Did those beings mean to engulf us both in a common destruction because we had come to know too much? Again, I thought of the abruptness and unnaturalness of that change in the situation which must have occurred between Akeley's penultimate and final letters. Something, my instinct told me, was terribly wrong. All was not as it seemed. That acrid coffee which I refused, had there not been an attempt by some hidden unknown entity to drug it? I must talk to Akeley at once and restore his sense of proportion. They had hypnotized him with their promises of cosmic revelations, but now he must listen to reason. We must get out of this before it would be too late. If he lacked the willpower to make the break for liberty, I would supply it. Or if I could not persuade him to go, I could at least go myself. Surely he would let me take his Ford and leave it in a garage at Brattleboro. I had noticed it in the shed, the door being left unlocked and open now that peril was deemed past, and I believed there was a good chance of its being ready for instant use. 
That momentary dislike of Akeley which I had felt during and after the evening's conversation was all gone now. He was in a position much like my own, and we must stick together. Knowing his indisposed condition, I hated to wake him at this juncture, but I knew that I must. I could not stay in this place till morning as matters stood. At last I felt able to act and stretched myself vigorously to regain command of my muscles. Arising with a caution more impulsive than deliberate, I found and donned my hat, took my valise, and started downstairs with the flashlight's aid. In my nervousness I kept the revolver clutched in my right hand, being able to take care of both valise and flashlight with my left. Why I exerted these precautions I do not really know, since I was even then on my way to awaken the only other occupant of the house. As I half tiptoed down the creaking stairs to the lower hall, I could hear the sleeper more plainly, and noticed that he must be in the room on my left, the living room I had not entered. On my right was the gaping blackness of the study in which I had heard the voices. Pushing open the unlatched door of the living room, I traced a path with the flashlight toward the source of the snoring, and finally turned the beams on the sleeper's face. But in the next second I hastily turned them away and commenced a cat-like retreat to the hall, my caution this time springing from reason as well as from instinct, for the sleeper on the couch was not Akeley at all, but my quondam guide, Noise. Just what the real situation was, I could not guess, but common sense told me that the safest thing was to find out as much as possible before arousing anybody. Regaining the hall, I silently closed and latched the living room door after me, thereby lessening the chances of awaking Noise. I now cautiously entered the dark study, where I expected to find Akeley, whether asleep or awake, in the great corner chair which was evidently his favorite resting place. As I advanced, the beams of my flashlight caught the great center table, revealing one of the hellish cylinders with sight and hearing machines attached, and with a speech machine standing close by, ready to be connected at any moment. This, I reflected, must be the encased brain I had heard talking during the frightful conference, and for a second I had a perverse impulse to attach the speech machine and see what it would say. It must, I thought, be conscious of my presence even now, since the sight and hearing attachments could not fail to disclose the rays of my flashlight and the faint creaking of the floor beneath my feet. But in the end I did not dare meddle with the thing. I idly saw that it was the fresh, shiny cylinder with Akeley's name on it, which I had noticed on the shelf earlier in the evening, in which my host had told me not to bother. Looking back at that moment, I can only regret my timidity and wish that I had boldly caused the apparatus to speak. God knows what mysteries and horrible doubts and questions of identity it might have cleared up. But then, it may be merciful that I let it alone. From the table I turned my flashlight to the corner where I thought Akeley was, but found to my perplexity that the great easy chair was empty of any human occupant asleep or awake. From the seat to the floor there trailed voluminously the familiar old dressing gown, and near it on the floor lay the yellow scarf and the huge foot bandages I had thought so odd. As I hesitated, striving to conjecture where Akeley might be, and why he had so suddenly discarded his necessary sick-room garments, I observed that the queer odor and sense of vibration were no longer in the room. What had been their cause? Curiously, it occurred to me that I had noticed them only in Akeley's vicinity. They had been strongest where he sat, and wholly absent except in the room with him or just outside the doors of that room. I paused, letting the flashlight wander about the dark study and racking my brain for explanations of the turn affairs had taken. Would to heaven I had quietly left the place before allowing that light to rest again on the vacant chair. As it turned out, I did not leave quietly, but with a muffled shriek which must have disturbed, though it did not quite awake, the sleeping sentinel across the hall. That shriek and noises still unbroken snore are the last sounds I ever heard in that morbidity-choked farmhouse beneath the black-wooded crest of a haunted mountain, that focus of trans-cosmic horror amidst the lonely green hills and curse-muttering brooks of a spectral rustic land. It is a wonder that I did not drop flashlight, valise, and revolver in my wild scramble, but somehow I failed to lose any of these. I actually managed to get out of that room and that house without making any further noise to drag myself and my belongings safely into the old Ford in the shed and to set that archaic vehicle in motion towards some unknown point of safety in the black moonless night. The ride that followed was a piece of delirium out of Poe or Rambeau or the drawings of Doré, but finally I reached Townsend. That is all. If my sanity is still unshaken, I am lucky. 
Sometimes I fear what the years will bring, especially since that new planet Pluto has been so curiously discovered. As I have implied, I let my flashlight return to the vacant easy chair after its circuit of the room, then noticing for the first time the presence of certain objects in the seat made inconspicuous by the adjacent loose folds of the empty dressing gown. These are the objects three in number which the investigators did not find when they came later on. As I said at the outset, there was nothing of actual visual horror about them. The trouble was in what they led one to infer. Even now, I have my moments of half-doubt, moments in which I half-accept the skepticism of those who attribute my whole experience to dream and nerves and delusion. The three things were damnably clever constructions of their kind and were furnished with ingenious metallic clamps to attach them to organic developments of which I dare not form any conjecture. I hope, devoutly hope, that they were the waxen products of a master artist, despite what my inmost fears tell me. Great God, that whisperer in darkness with its morbid odor and vibrations, sorcerer, emissary, changeling, outsider, that hideous repressed buzzing and all the time in that fresh shiny cylinder on the shelf, poor devil, prodigious surgical, biological, chemical and mechanical skill. For the things in the chair, perfect to the last subtle detail of microscopic resemblance or identity, were the face and hands of Henry Wentworth Akeley. The Whisperer in Darkness by H.P. Lovecraft was read by Andrew Lee. Production by Chris Lackey and Chad Pfeiffer. Brought to you by the listeners of the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast at hppodcraft.com. Thank you for your support.